Okay, so here we go. So Hurricane Katrina, so what happened? So this view is uh, uh, north of uh, the main nut of New Orleans. We're looking southward towards the Gulf. And we're looking over, right, the Superdome. Um, so the, the downtown area that we call the Central Business District or the CBD is there. Um, and what we're seeing is not a river, those are streets. All that, uh, all that reflecting light is coming off of water and you see, you know, burning craziness that happens whenever we have these massive scale disasters in an urban setting, things break, electrical lines break, gas lines break. So even if there's no lightning or, or bombs going off per se, a lot of the infrastructure cracks and crumbles and causes um, risks of, of their own and, and, and challenges of their own. Um, as we'll hear about uh, in the next few weeks and as we'll talk about when we're there, um, this is, and as I mentioned before, this is unacceptable, what, what happened, right? So this is unacceptable anywhere. It's unacceptable when it happens in the shores of Africa and Southeast Asia, Australia, wherever. It's really, really ridiculous that this happens in the wealthiest country in the US and it's really, really ridiculous that it happens to a place that's so fundamentally important to the fabric of our um, American history and our American people and our American identity. And so um, all of this stuff was imperiled by Hurricane Katrina. So there's Michael, you guys will meet when we do our, our cooking school. He's sitting there showing how magicians uh, used to do, um, how magicians make magic. They use a cinnamon. And in this case, he's making bananas foster. So we're flaring bananas foster there. Um, on the lower left is Kermit Ruffins, who's a, a trumpeter. And this is at a place called Bullets that we um, may well go to. It depends if he's playing there or not. And then, uh, you know, the story of Mardi Gras, which we'll hear about uh, soon. Um, all of this stuff was imperiled in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit. And we didn't know if these things would be continuing on. There's a whole history here. And when we get to our, our um, music and lyrics and all that kind of good stuff, uh, there's, there's a huge amount of history. Racial history, political history, uh, environmental history, all this stuff that's wrapped up. And so um, while there, we can start this conversation in many, many different places and we can spend a whole semester just talking about how humans interact with water and the natural landscape, this is, this is a, a fine starting point for those of us that haven't, haven't had a chance to think about this. These are the floods of 1927. So this was, so we just, we just had a bunch of rain last few weeks, right? Tons of rain. Um, what we're now uh, more typically referring to as atmospheric rivers. There's so much water that's coming. Uh, we used to call it Pineapple Express. Now we call them atmospheric rivers. But, but the same idea, you know, huge deluges. So my dad's house up in the Bay Area, um, he walked out whenever it was last week or, yeah, Monday, some, some, something like that. Walked out, water all in the first floor. So um, I was like, oh man, did the pipe break or whatever? No. Just there was so much rain coming down the hills that it, it was water inside the house. Uh, an, a house in, where was it? In Sausalito, in Marin County, just north of San Francisco, slid down the hill. And a lady was inside, so thankfully she was okay, but the whole house just went down the hill. There was nothing broken with the foundation or anything. There was just so much rain that came down. The, the soil eroded and the, and the hillside essentially melted and the house just went down to the street below. We're going to be seeing, what's that? She got a new address. Uh, I believe so. <laughs> Although she probably uh, screwed with taxes somehow. Um, so, so, so this notion of, of catastrophic flooding is a long thing in human history. Um, you know, we could talk about the Roman, in, in Western civilization, we talk about the Romans that um, started this idea of draining wetlands. So they came up with the term reclamation. So the water is bad, the wetlands are bad. If we can suck this water out of the landscape, if we can control this water and drain the wetlands, and th in their days they would typically cut ditches and hopefully let the water go out faster, they would so-called reclaim the land. So in other words, the land was wasted when it was getting flooded and stuff, but if we got the floodwaters off, that was a benefit. That was sort of more or less how people behaved towards 
water and the hydrosphere and stuff like that up until the uh, early part of the 1900s. Then our engineering prowess grew tremendously and our ability to, to build structures, to manipulate the landscape, to, to change things to our whims uh, grew in, in stature and power and ability. And then all it took was uh, something like this. So this is 1927. So much rain fell in the central part of the US that there was these massive floods that came down. And uh, when we take a break, I'll play you Randy Newman's song that speaks to this. And so what happened here is, is as this, these floodwaters migrated down the Mississippi Valley, more and more floods. And it was sort of like, a, imagine just a wave rolling across the beach, same kind of thing. So kind of water level goes up, water level goes up, jumps the levees and floods everything. And not just floods everything for a little bit, I mean like really flood stuff. And so um, we saw this huge devastation all throughout. The song that I'll play for you guys is specifically about how that played out in Louisiana. It happened in Louisiana, and again, now at this point, 1920s, we have uh, not, not uh, satellite communication, but we have, we have telephone lines and, and rapid communication, right? So, so back in the day, 100 years ago, these guys might not have known what was coming. In this case, people knew it was coming, right? So they had, they had days uh, of warning that, that this big lump of bulge of water, if you will, was coming down and going to cause them problems. So these folks are like, oh my God, right? As we talked about last time, water is constrained within the levees. So levees are, are these, these sort of dams that go along, along the rivers as opposed to across the rivers. Uh, goes down the rivers and, um, and, and you know, the water is going to swell up, swell up, swell up. And they're, oh my gosh, the city of New Orleans, huge commercial center, all kinds of banking, all kinds of industry, all kinds of port activity, this and that. We can't let that, that that's, that's too valuable, proper, too valuable a chunk of property. So what we need to do is we need to release the pressure, right? We need to let the water um, uh, not overtop the levees, but essentially pop the plug and allow it to go somewhere else. And so where do we do that? Ah, we'll go to Plaquemines Parish where we work, where, where, where we'll be. And what we'll do, we'll go down there and we'll, we'll, we'll blow the levee and allow the, the pressure to be released and the water can flow out into those areas. That is farmland. So from a sort of mile high perspective, yeah, sure, farmland less impactful, right, than the big city. The problem was that farmland um, was all sharecropper land. What's sharecropper? Sharecropper is slavery by a different name. So sharecropper were folks that are so poor that they were indentured, they were essentially indentured to the landowner. So in theory, in theory, they were, uh, uh, you know, renters of the land. But in reality, they couldn't, the, the, the costs that they were charged was more than they could earn from the land. So every year they go more and more into debt. So this is poor white folks, this is a lot of African American folks, right? And so when this big pulse was coming down the river, what are we going to do? Let's blow this land. So it wasn't like, hey, and so these businessmen came from New Orleans and they said, hey, look, we're going to blow this. We know it's going to screw up your crops, but we're going to pay you, right? We're going to pay you fair market value for your crops. So, you know, we know you're getting screwed, but we're going to make you whole. Guess what happened? They didn't. And some of the folks like, yeah, we don't know if we want to do this. So then they held them, um, by sh uh, you know, held them at bay with shotguns to be on the levee. It was, it was totally, totally effed up in whatever dimension you want to talk about. Economic, racial, uh, 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 environmental, whatever. And so they blew the levee. They flooded these folks' land. And uh, then afterwards, like, oh, OK, great. Boom, gone, we're gone. So that notion has, well, I mean, that's but one example of what was going on for a long time, but that specific notion of the wealthy folks coming in, dynamiting the poor folks area so that the poor folks area got screwed over to save the wealthy folks' area, that plays out exactly in Hurricane Katrina. Um, that's not what happened, but this, this burden of this injustice was in everybody's minds, at least the poor folks' minds. And so that really complicates the response. But, but this notion of flooding, damage, a uh, huge problem.
So again, this, the, so the floods start, it rain, starts raining in 27. The floods go out through the winter and spring. And uh, it's a huge problem. And it's a huge political thing. Not only is it, does it screw individual folks like those sharecroppers and stuff, it, it, it kills a gazillion people and wrecks havoc around the country. And so people say, gosh darn it, we got to do something. Never again. We will not be v held hostage by nature's uh, you know, vicissitudes. We're going to control it. And so you saw all this rhetoric, like right here, like, you know, like, like the Mississippi, and, and, and we have to do something, and we, and, and, and we need to control the water. Okay. Um, I think we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. Okay. So, wait. Do I want to come back to this? Hmm. I'm skipping around here. Okay. So uh, the, the other context, um, so th that was a little bit of the, the, the desire to control water. What do we do? That led to this huge project funded by you, the American people, through Congress, to start improving flood protection. Th that does not mean what we would think of it today. It means hardening hardening all these structures, building things up, making the walls on the, on the edges of the river even taller and more robust. This is not the I Ching. This is not yield and overcome. This is not a Buddhist way of thinking about how to deal with water or nature. This is F you, I'm a football player, I'm going to stand right here and, and break that with my brute force. Brute force of material, brute force of engineering, brute force of construction. And so that, that's what the, the late 20s give us, this mission that we must control nature. And we see it. And also, then this is the Great Depression. And right after this, after this comes the huge building era of the great dams, um, Hoover Dam, all, all, all that era. Same thing, right? It's like we got to control nature. Nature's too dangerous. We can't let it dictate to us what's going on. So we build the levees. One of the main outcomes of the levees for... Of, southern Louisiana is this. So we're looking at, at an image of the lower right part of the state of Louisiana, satellite image. Um, now this, this thing is about uh, 15 years old now, this, this image, but, but it still proves the point and it's one of the best uh, illustrations. But what we're looking at is, wet, okay, so all of the, the gray, the, the, the black and white, is the background context. So that, that was, um, We'll call it 1950s or so. We'll call it 1950s uh, Louisiana. The red and yellow are all places that have either been lost or will soon be lost. The greens are areas where we've added to our wetland, coastal wetlands. So uh, we could do all, I could show you a bunch of statistics and stuff. The short version is there's way more red than there is green. This whole landscape is Swiss cheesing away. It's eroding away. It's, it's a big gazillion million tooth cavities and the stuff's just rotting before our eyes. And so obviously right here, again, if, if we're trying to figure out where we are, always look for Lake Pontchartrain. Boom, here's Lake Pontchartrain. Again, it's a lake, but it's not really a lake. We call it a lake, but it's really connected to the ocean. So it's salt water. It's at sea level. So there you find Lake Pontchartrain. Here's the Mississippi, this big meandering, wah, 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 wah. And then here's New Orleans, right where the Mississippi goes, right underneath Lake Pontchartrain. So that's where we are. And then uh, we work down over here. Here's English Turn. And then this is now in Plaquemines Parish. And Plaquemines Parish goes all the way down here. We call this the Bird's Foot Delta of the Mississippi River. And this is uh, basically where the Mississippi River uh, dumps out into the Gulf of Mexico. So this whole thing now, this whole Mississippi River has now been levied, has now been dammed along the edges uh, on the banks of the river. So that typical spring flooding that we talked about last time, where the, where the water jumps out of its uh, banks and that sediment is deposited and has created the incredibly fertile plain of the Mississippi Delta, uh, that process has been severed for the last many decades. Um, and that's what's, I mean, there's various things going on here, but that's the most important thing. The loss of sediment supply to counteract the natural and human screwed with rate of wetland loss.
So if we did, if we could do a single thing, if we could just yank down those levees, we would, that would take care of 60, 70% of the problem. But we can't because people put their houses in the flood area now. We've put, we've put barns in the flood area. We've put, put agricultural fields and all that kind of stuff. So it's a huge, huge challenge. To give us some context, in the lower 48 states, so this is, this is the estimate roughly from about um, 1850, so we'll say essentially when California became a state, 1850 to now. We've lost, the, the lower 48 states have lost about half of our wetlands that used to exist. But that loss is not homogeneous across all of the US. California, has the unfortunate, the dubious distinction of leading the nation in the proportion of wetlands lost. We've lost 91% of our historic wetlands in this state. The 9% that remain aren't kick butt, awesome, awesome, let me do the best thing ever. Those are mostly degraded as well. This is just talking about the, the aerial extent, the two-dimensional extent. So when we talk about wetland loss here, it's a real thing. And people go, oh, hey, tree hugger, hey, oh, can we compromise? Compromise? Dude, you already took 91% of it. Compromise? I think we already compromised in terms of letting development, fragmentation, destruction take the vast, vast majority of this ecosystem. So California has the unfortunate distinction of having the greatest proportional loss. And, and for example, this is a, a map that I like to use. This is from... Um, uh, several years ago, but this shows the San Francisco Bay Area, and all of that grayness is all the built, you know, San Jose and the um, Alameda and all that area. Roughly, the, the majority of that gray used to not be gray. It used to be open water or tidal wetlands. And so we've, we've filled in a huge amount of the San Francisco Bay Area, not intentionally initially, all from the 49ers. So when the 49ers came and wanted to strike it rich and ran the Sierras, they used hydraulic mining. So they used the river, they essentially channeled the river into sluices that channeled into smaller sluices that channeled into fire hoses. And we essentially eroded the Sierra Nevada mountains looking for gold. All that sediment ran down the rivers and filled in the San Francisco Bay Area, or excuse me, the San Francisco Bay. And it filled it into to the, so much such that if we walk out there now into Market Street down, you know, the financial district in San Francisco, you're actually walking on the old husks of, of sailing ships. So radically transformed, radically degraded the wetland resource there. That's California. Louisiana, they've uh, done a little bit better, proportionally speaking, on the national average, but you know, California, we have a lot of things. Wetlands aren't, aren't the dominant ecosystem in most of our state. In Louisiana, they are. So while proportionally Louisiana has lost about half of its historic wetlands over the last 150 odd, some odd years, but they've lost the greatest amount of wetlands. So here, California, greatest proportional loss, Louisiana, greatest quantity of loss. So between our two states, we really tell the extremes of how our society uh, has treated um, these important ecosystems, wetlands. So what's driving, what's driving the, the loss of this wetland? Again, this is all setting us up for what happens with Hurricane Katrina. So um, uh, some of this stuff is going on day and night everywhere around the planet. Other things are specific to south, southern Louisiana. So the first is subsidence. What does subsidence mean? Subsidence means the ground is one level and it subsides, it gets lower. And so that's a normal thing. Now, wetlands, there's a nutria over there, we'll talk about the nutria in a second, but there's a nutria and, and there's all these plants, there's all these grasses. Remember, we, uh, a wetland dominated by veg uh, herbaceous vegetation, we call a marsh. Wetlands dominated by woody vegetation, we call a swamp. Either way, we have a bunch of vegetation in these wetland areas and then something happens. You step on the plant, uh, wind breaks the tree, something like that, and that, that organic material falls down and hits the mud, hits the silt, hits the sediment, and it kind of gets smooshed into the ground. Because there's a lot of water, stagnant, 
uh, not a lot of aeration. So one of the reasons why wetlands sometimes smell stinky, right? There's a lot of anaerobic respiration. And so that means that that log or that, that leaf or whatever it is, doesn't, it's not like dropping it on, on the, your lawn at home, which would break down pretty quickly. It takes a long time to break down. So the sediments in wetlands are very organic rich. They have a lot of organic materials. And that's essentially stuff in the process of, of breaking down. So it will break down, absolutely, it just takes a little bit longer. But what that means is at any given time, we have you know, soil that's, this, that's you know, X, X elevation. Over time, doing nothing else, adding nothing else, those, those organic things, the sticks, the twigs, the leaves, they eventually break down. And so that soil gets more compact as, that, as that, those big chunks of organic stuff go away, it, it squishes and we call that subsidence, okay? Again, there's the background, this is a natural thing. Every wetland around the planet is experiencing some level of subsidence. We have screwed with that by sucking out stuff from the ground. Just like if we had a soda and we had a straw, I suppose they have straws because they're evil, but if we had an evil straw <laughs> and I stuck it in the soda and I started sucking on the straw, right, what would happen? The, the soda would go down in the cup, right? Same idea. So if we remove the, the filler underneath the, the sediment, the sediment will go, the soil will go lower. And so that happens when we pump water out, but most commonly here in Louisiana, the biggest driver there is sucking out oil and gas. There's so much oil and gas extraction that we're pulling out the, the, the volume underneath the soil and that, that's speeding the subsidence rate. That, that's increasing the rate of the soil level going down. Okay, then we have sea level rise. Sea level rise, the sea level has naturally over time gone up and gone down. So there's some level of sea level rise that's just, that's just would be going on if humans were never on this planet. Uh, but <laughs> that's a little teeny bit of the sea level rise. A large portion of it now is caused by you and me and the burning of fossil fuels and uh, what we generally refer to as the climate change, right? So this, the rate at which, the, the relative rate at which glaciers are melting and all this and that, and water, the sea level is going up, is causing a problem. So here, we're going down at faster and faster rates. The soil is going down at faster and faster rates. The sea is coming up at faster and faster rates. Right? Not a good combination. These things are, these things have, you know, again, these processes subside and sea level rise natural things, but the rates are worsening. Okay, then we add in these new stressors, these novel stressors, these stressors that these systems have never ever seen in their evolution. And we already talked about uh, levees, right? We talked about the, the, their construction. And their main function in the context of this discussion is to cut off that sediment supply that would otherwise be roughly counteracting the subsidence. Uh, and then we have introduced new things like Nutria. So there's a great new documentary. I was trying to get it for you guys, but it's, it's making, still making the movie circuits right now. So if you can see it, watch it. It's great. I saw it on a, a PBS station a few weeks ago. It's called Rodents of Unusual Size. And it's all about Nutria. Um, so uh, if you have a chance to see it, cool. But I, I couldn't get it for you guys. But um, these guys are... Um, sort of a they look like a cross between sort of a rat and a beaver so they come from south america they're you know they're about beaver size they're about a, a big you know bobcat sort of skunk large skunk sort of size big raccoon sort of size and um they were introduced intentionally in south louisiana uh for uh the fur trade so this was considered a sustainable sustainable product and people need fur to stay warm, make coats and stuff, so we're gonna make these guys. And there's a whole long story. The lore is that a hurricane came through and broke open all the cages and these nutria escaped. That's probably not what happened. Um, but nobody knows exactly. But it, much more likely that um, when some of the prices started falling out of the market, people were like, ah, screw it, I'm gonna let these guys go. Just like people let goldfish go and lionfish and all these kinds of things go. Regardless, however it happened, 
starting in the 1930s, these critters started going out into our wetlands. These are novel species for this system. Voracious, voracious eaters. They can eat um, two, three, four times their body mass a day in vegetation. And they eat and they eat and they eat and they eat and they eat. So um, they can one, you know, eat a bunch from an area, but how they typically function is they start a hole in the marsh. So they don't necessarily go, there aren't a wall of nutria that are just mowing across, but they start to eat an area and munch an area and keep going. And that then leads to more and more uh, uh, erosion and these other processes can get going. And then we have hurricanes. Hurricanes have always been a part of this landscape. They're a natural part of this landscape, but what's changing is the intensity and the frequency with which we're experiencing them. So, her, so all these things up here are going on every day of the year. Subsidence happening every day of the year, sea level rise happening every day of the year, levees happening every, the, the effect of levees happening every day of the year, nutria happening every day of the year. Uh, hurricanes are a pulsed, right, disturbance. When Katrina hit, they jumped us forward in our, so we, I was showing that, that image before about rates of wetland loss. Depending on where we're talking about Louisiana, they jump us forward maybe about 50 years in that, with that one storm. So huge damage to the wetlands. Again, in a healthy, robust system, a hurricane would kind of be bad, but the system would bounce back. But as we're continuing to stress these systems, these perturbations, it's, it's much harder for the system to be resilient and bounce back from these, these things. Does that make sense? Anything here not make sense, you guys? Okay, so these are all the big stressors and the drivers of wetland loss across Louisiana. Okay. Here is how we typically think of this region of the world. It's natural to think of the region of the world this way. It's how we're, it's typically presented to us and uh, it's how we think about stuff. This is a political map, or this is a political view of the world. The, before Katrina, the last hurricane to strike New Orleans was Hurricane Betsy in 1965. So if you, get, if you guys haven't seen these yet, but these, this is a storm track. So when we are looking at, the, at an oncoming hurricane, gonna hit whatever, Puerto Rico, uh, Texas, whatever, you see these cones of probability. But after the fact, the way researchers look at this is with these types of, of uh, track plots. So this was the course of Betsy. So Betsy came across, she was coming up across the Atlantic. She went up, uh, sort of looked like she was gonna go up the Eastern seaboard and then kind of like, what? No, and kind of curly cued back and then went south again went around essentially uh, by the Florida Keys, went up and then boom, and went right into New Orleans. We'll talk about hur hurricanes in a second, but suffice it to say, hurricanes get their power by being over warm oceans. And so here the color is also important. So the color refers to the strength of the storm. So the hotter the color, the stronger the storm, meaning, meaning the faster the winds and, and more destructive power that the storm has. So see, it's all red, 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 red. Gets on the land and then, and then begins to lose steam. And then all hurricanes, when they come ashore, lose strength. And, and eventually we'll, we'll totally peter out. But that's what we're looking at. So, this is, so, when pe so one of the problems with Hurricane Katrina, one of the problems with the Woolsey fire, one of the problems with the Thomas fire, all these things, I mentioned before that, for example, where I live up the top of the hill, even though we were all evacuated with the Woolsey fire, um, when I went in to do some inspections, unofficially, uh, I counted about 10 to 15% of my neighbors were still there in the area they should have evacuated, right? So uh, we saw the same thing in Malibu, same thing all around. So not everybody evacuates. Some people can't evacuate uh, because they don't have a car or they have a physical condition. They can't, you know, just... I don't know, whatever, they, they're tied to a, an oxygen machine, they can't leave or something. But then there's also some folks that, that take the option not to leave. And that would be most of my neighbors up there, right? Most of my neighbors up there, could, they weren't 
starving, poor, and didn't have a vehicle or you know weren't on an iron lung, nothing like that. They opted to stay. A lot of people in New Orleans opted to stay. The vast majority who stayed, it wasn't by choice, but, but suffice to say, some people stayed. Other people didn't leave as soon as they could have left. Why? Because they were using, we use all, it's a natural tendency for humans to use our most recent memory to guide what we think is going to happen. And in this era of a changing climate, that is incredibly dangerous. Incredibly, incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Just because you survived that fire, that flood, that whatever, you know, five years ago, it's no guarantee that the flood that's coming five years from now is going to be that same level of intensity. It's much more likely to be crazier and less predictable. But this was the last one to strike. Now, this was before I was born. I know I'm old. I know, but I'm not that old, right? Uh, Tom was alive when this happened, but I don't want to. You know, I don't want to out Tom, but he's older. Anyway, so um, so now if, if you know, hey, so I live in New Orleans. I, I've never experienced a hurricane having a direct hit on my city as long as I've been alive, right? And there's somebody on the radio saying, go, go, go. The mayor's saying, get out, get out, get out. I'm like, yeah, I, know I should probably get out, but oh God, I got this paper to write and these other things, right? So you can understand how people are like, hey. So after the fact, when the reporters come in, why didn't you leave? Why are you so stupid? You know, a lot of people say, I, I didn't think it was gonna be like it ended up being, right? So here's the problem. The problem is this is what many folks were using as their frame of reference. This is the wrong frame of reference. So again, this is the last hurricane to hit Katrina, or the last hurricane to hit New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina in 2005. This is the reality that people should have been looking at. These are all the storm tracks between 1965 and 2005. That is the proper frame of reference. So yes, it is true that between 1965 and 2005, no hurricane made a direct hit on New Orleans, but you know what? They were just lucky. That is the reality. So if you live in this part of the world, hurricanes are a natural phenomenon. If you don't have one for a decade or two, you are lucky. So we have to look at these challenges, whatever they are, socioeconomic, uh, 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 environmental, we have to look at them with open eyes and full understanding. And most of the time we don't. And that's what gets us into trouble. And that's what is so frustrating about some folks that refuse to, to take these problems on uh, with full force, they don't appear to see the reality of all of the storms that blow in to the Gulf Coast over the, the ensuing decades here. Okay, um, and not only that, a lot of stuff is hard to see. Here is uh, another uh, representation of the Gulf Coast. So here you go, this is how we typically think about it. Look, there you go, there's water out there, there's land over there. These are all the infrastructure support components of the oil and gas industry. These are all pipelines, uh, you know, lines going out to offshore platforms, etc. Huge. I mean, it's insane. Swiss cheese with oil and gas production, the Gulf Coast. These are all offshore oil and gas wellheads. That's insane. That's a lot, right? We have 27 platforms off our coast. And we're like, oh my God, there's so much oil and gas. <laughs> Ain't nothing compared to there. This is the stuff in the water. This is the stuff on land. So virtually, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, but almost everybody has a wellhead on their property or, or very nearby, right? It tends to be mostly oil offshore. It tends to be mostly gas on land, but the same, but right, the same thing persists. So when I talk about subsidence being driven by oil and gas, that's why. I'm not talking about three or four wellheads somewhere. I'm talking about a ubiquitous, what's become a ubiquitous component of the landscape of this part of our country. And this is what we'll see when we go down there. So these are some of my students in one of our early classes. So this is, um, 
This is the end of the road, the, the bird's foot delta, the, the, as far south as we can drive without getting in a boat. And uh, here these guys are hanging out there. They're, so they're at the edge of the road, and we're looking straight, and what we see there are cypress trees. What we see there are dead cypress trees. Cypress can take you know, a whole lot of, you know, they live in wetlands. They can take being waterlogged a tremendous amount. They have these fantastic knees, these cypress knees. They're these bumps that we're not entirely sure how they work, but they seem to um, help. One of the things they probably do is help aerate the roots. So even though it's stagnant and, and not a lot of water movement, they help keep uh, aerobic metabolism going on in the, in the physiology of the tree. So they can take being underwater a long time. They are not an aquatic tree. Just because they can withstand being wet, waterlogged, underwater for a while, they cannot live their entirety of their life underwater. So what's happening here in this landscape is all of these trees were born when it was land. And they started growing. They turned into a sapling. And they turned from a sapling to a small tree. And a small tree, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And they were a big tree. But over the last couple decades, the subsidence, the sea level rise, all this stuff made it such that this area now is essentially continuous water. So all those trees have drowned. There will be no more cypress to grow in here unless we did some massive restoration, right? Because to grow, we'd have to fill this area with sediment, with soil, with, with material to raise the, it up so that the seed could land on dirt, can land on dry soil to germinate. And so that, this is what the hollowing out looks like. Um, an article I'll share with you, or a series of articles I'll share with you guys is from our, our friends at what used to be called the Times Picky, and there's all kinds of changes. We'll talk about this word there. I used to refer to this news organization as the Times Picayune, which is the newspaper. It no longer exists in this form. It has now become an online outlet so it's now called NOLA.com. A few times a week, they grab some of the online articles and they produce a, a printed paper. But New Orleans is now the largest city in the US without a, a continuously operating um, daily newspaper. As we'll hear, the Times Picayune was central to what happened with Hurricane Katrina. They were a key source of news and information for people. But what I'm talking about right here is before K Katrina happened in 2005. This is 2002. This is a series um, by um, a, a group of reporters on the Times Picayune staff, including Mark Schlifstein, who hopefully we'll meet and say hi to um, if he hasn't retired yet. He's constantly threatening to retire. Um, but this is a what if scenario. So this was planning by our emergency management professionals, and they said, oh, what if, right? So we had a, a, a hurricane called Hurricane George that came through, and they're saying, what if this thing hadn't turned to the last minute? What if it really came? And essentially, and you guys will read this, essentially this is predicting what would happen to the city if this hurricane hit, and basically this is more or less what exactly happened with Hurricane Katrina. So as we'll see when we get to the politics part of this, You'll hear people saying, we had no idea. How could we know? There's no way to know. It's an act of God. Uh, no. Right? This was laid out in the paper, in, in the paper across town three years before Hurricane Katrina. In fact, one of my friends who we probably won't see who now runs uh, the, uh, Louisiana Audubon, um, I, when I went to grad school with him, he went back to Louisiana. And he used to say, you should come to Mardi Gras. I said, oh, I'd love to come to Mardi Gras, I'd love to come to Mardi Gras. Uh, but I'm kind of busy. And then I'd always plan to go, and then, I know you find this very shocking, then I would get too busy. And then I was like, oh, Mardi Gras was last week. Like, Damn. So I'd always miss going to Mardi Gras. And he used to say, you better come to Mardi Gras because we're one hurricane away from losing the whole city. One hurricane will come and nuke this place and it could be gone forever. So again, this wasn't total surprise. This wasn't out of the blue. This wasn't no one could predict it. It was on the papers uh, uh, and people were talking about the possibility of this thing happening. 
Okay, let's talk about the lead up. Is this okay? You have questions? I'm just I'm talking a lot. You guys aren't. I'm not really giving you guys a chance to ask questions. Any questions so far? Are they unclear? Okay. Now we get to 2005. So this is um, this is uh, what was going on. Now uh, let's talk a little bit about hurricanes. So there are uh, hurricanes are, are influenced by a bunch of things: oceanic conditions, atmospheric conditions, etc. So we, we have in the past been in periods of, you know, not many hurricanes, more hurricanes, less hurricanes, et cetera. So the st stage that's being set for the 2005 um, hurricane season is this. We had an active multi-decadal signal, meaning that um, there was a lot of evidence that we were in a, um, a, 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 a hurricane-friendly time, okay? And so you'll, I'll show you the data in a second. But, but so there's different categories. But basically, we're in a, an above normal hurricane era since 1995. The only time, the only years we weren't in the, in the you know, more active than normal phase was when we had El Ninos, which is a phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean that has some sort of global consequences that act to, to make hurricanes less likely to form in the Atlantic. So except for those two years, every other year, right? For 10 years, hurricanes, more hurricanes, more hurricanes than we normally, quote unquote, normally expect. Next, we had above average sea surface temperature. And that sea surface temperature is really, really key for, that, for the fuel for the hurricanes and the strength of the hurricanes. And then lastly, we had really favorable uh, winds and air pressure. Um, and I'll show you how that, how that works in a second. So that translated to, and so then what happens every year um, uh, before the, the onset of hurricane season, there's two centers that make prediction. There's, NCAR, there's National, uh, NCAR, National Climactic and Atmospheric Research Group in Colorado, and there's a group in, um, there's a group in Florida, the National Weather Service, and they make their predictions, and they use slightly different methodologies. And long story short, these guys were both, both of these information sources were saying, oh my God, it's gonna be a crazy hurricane year. So not, not only was there all this long-term prep that there's gonna be a problem, this exact year people are saying, you know, months before the hurricane seasons began, hey, oh my God, we're gonna be 175% above hyperactive time. So they're trying to sound the alarm as much as they can. We think this is going to be bad. So this is what this is what Hurricane Katrina looked like uh, from a satellite view. So here she comes, boom, hits the tip of Florida, and then really the eye, boom, forms. Now it's a Category Five, whoosh, boom, right up, right up New Orleans. So watch it again. So. It's getting stronger, 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 stronger. So check it out. It is, this was an insane storm. Extremely strong, how we typically measure them. With, this is, the, the, we're in the process of coming up with a new way to refer to hurricanes. But the process that we had at this point, and we still basically have, is the hurricane category list. And so that goes from category one to five. That's based on wind speed. Why? Well, because a few decades ago, some American Red Cross workers who were responding to disasters in Central America were having a hard time. They'd go to some storms and they'd be like, oh my God, everybody here needs a new house. They go to some other storms like, well, this one wasn't so bad. People just need some blue tarps. So they were trying to find from a first responder emergency disaster standpoint, how do we, how do we communicate to, to our fellow first responders, this is a bad hurricane, this is an intermediate hurricane, this is a relatively light hurricane. So they came up with this hurricane ranking system based solely on wind speed. So the category of the hurricane is based on how fast the wind is blowing. But check this out. I mean, and that's obviously part of it, but look at this, man. I mean, this hurricane is going from basically the Texas border to the East Coast. 
This is an insanely large storm. So it's not just what we've come to realize. It's not just how intense or how strong the system is. It's also the scale, the spatial magnitude over which that destruction is being experienced. And right now, we, right now, if we had a hurricane that was super, super tiny and a Category 4, and a hurricane that was over across the size of California and a Category 4, they would be referred to as the same, same destructive potential. Clearly, that's not the case. Clearly, that's not the case. So, so that was Hurricane Katrina. Oops, I got to zoom it again. So this is what it looked like when she was a Category 5 storm, which is the strongest category. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I, mm, is it 160 or 165? It, 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 it's something like that. Yeah. So this is so this so this basically means you can't stand up. So if if you walk outside and probably your car won't stay on the ground, it'll probably be scooching across the right. I mean, you always see these. Who the hell knows why these weather guys are like, it's a hurricane! So I'm gonna stand like, like a jackass, I'm gonna stand out here and like, look at me be blown away! But right, when they start to, when they start to lean in, right? That's like category one, right? By the time we start getting up to these higher categories, you can't even stand straight. More importantly, it's not even smart to be outside because if, if my T train blew up in the air, it could you know, take your head off, right? So I mean, stuff, it not only is, wind blowing, but it's picking up objects. And those objects are ricocheting, blowing around, and it's just incredibly dangerous. Um, 157 or higher. Excellent. Thank you, Google. I like that. That's good. Again, the scale is what we want to focus on right here, in that it's not sending emergency resources or, or people or helpers or whatever to a city. It's the whole region is, is in trouble. So the hurricane hits. We have the initial impact. You guys good? You want to take a quick break?